Today we want to continue our discussion of regional human rights, and now we want to look at Africa and the Americas. Uh, the institutions we're dealing with as we get to these two regions are the African Union and in the Americas, the Organization of American States. Our objectives today are to build on the study of European human rights measures and the European Convention of Human Rights, look at what the African Union and the Organization of American States have done. We want to compare uh, what has gone on in Europe with what takes place in Africa and the Americas. We want to look at the human rights treaties. We want to look at the procedure and jurisprudence of the regional courts and um, review the participation of nations in the region in the human rights uh, processes. Let's go first to the Organization of American States. Uh, this is a relatively new organization uh, founded in 1948, but it is new in respect to attempts to coordinate the nations in the Americas. Those attempts have been going on for many, many years. Well, the Organization of American States was organized in 1948, and all nations in the Americas are members. In 1969, the American Convention on Human Rights uh, was adopted and it entered, entered into force in 1978. The American Convention uh, recognizes many of the same rights that we uh, see uh, recognized in the European Convention. Although it's a little bit different language, which we'll examine in a moment. Now, not all the nations in the Americas have ratified the American Convention of Human Rights. Notable holdouts are Canada and the United States. We want to look at the American Convention, but first let's talk about the Declaration, the American Declaration of Rights and Duties of Man. We've said already that the Organization of American States was organized in 1948, and one of the first things that was done by AAOAU was to adopt the American Declaration of Rights and Duties of Man. Uh, this was adopted uh, a little bit uh, less than a year before the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You will find very similar provisions between the American Declaration, first adopted, and the uh, Declaration adopted as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's very significant that in many respects, uh, leading into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the American states were very significant in providing leadership. And that leadership has not been adequately uh, recognized uh, in the past. The, uh, the, the full American Convention on Human Rights came into being uh, in 1978 after being proposed uh, in 1969. If we look at the provisions of the American Convention, we'll find Chapter 1 has a, a general obligation, Chapter 2, civil and political rights of the very much the type uh, that uh, we've seen in the European Convention, um, rights such as uh, uh, fair trial, humane treatment, privacy, freedom of, of conscience, assembly, and so forth. Article uh, Chapter 3 of the American Convention has a single article on economic, social, and cultural rights. Chapter 4 has a derogation provision similar to that that we looked at in Article 15 of the European Convention. And Chapter 5 speaks to individual responsibilities. Beginning with Chapter 6 through 9, the Inter-American Commission is recognized and the Inter-American Court although we don't get the Inter-American Court for some time uh, into uh, this history we're looking at. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, is created in, in 1959. It sits in Washington, D.C. It has seven members. In 1961, it began sending representatives to check on human rights in all the American nations. In 1965, 
it was authorized to receive individual complaints. Now, let's think back for a moment on the European Convention of Human Rights. We noted in, uh, in last lecture that this was a very significant development in, uh, in Europe, particularly in those uh, European countries which had once been a part of the a Soviet bloc of nations, so the so-called nations behind the Iron Curtain. But uh, in, in the Americas, uh, we have uh, the International, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Um, we do not have the American Convention until 1969 and 1979, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is established. So we move from the uh, commission uh, to uh, which has jurisdiction over all nations uh, in the Americas, uh, but has, does not have judicial power in the same way that we think of courts having full judicial power. It is, however, the gatekeeper uh, for cases going to the, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. As we begin now to look at the court, the court may hear cases that are sent by the commission or are referred by a state party. So there are two possible routes to the contentious jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. One uh, is that a state party sends a case uh, to the court, and the other is that after screening, the uh, Inter-American uh, Convention uh, Commission on Human Rights uh, clears that and sends it uh, to the court. As you look at the procedure that's used, then individuals who have claims can file that complaint with a commission. The commission then looks at that complaint, first of all decides whether or not it's admissible, and then if, it's, if it is admissible, the commission will take that up, determine whether the complaint has any merit, and if it has merit, the uh, commission will then make recommendations to the nation against whom the complaint is brought about a way to, to remedy the problems that have uh, caused the complaint. It's only after this process is completed that the case then moves on to the court. So uh, again, contrasting the inter-American uh, court system with that of the European Human Rights Court, you, you see here a commission in the Americas that's a gatekeeper. You have to go through this commission in order to uh, get, to the, uh, get to the court. That's not true any longer in Europe. It was true at one time, and as you look at these cases from the European Court of Human Rights, you, you'll frequently see some reference to a commission because a commission procedure was in place until the late 1990s in Europe. Uh, in the American system, uh, this commission still exists, and it, can, and it exists as a, as a gatekeeper and is something of a mediator. Uh, the court is only a last resort. Every effort is made to try to get resolution before a matter gets to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court has not been accepted by all nations in the Americas. Now, there are 21 nations that have, have accepted uh, its jurisdiction as of 2013. And um, as you look through that list, you'll note that neither the United States or Canada are on that list, but very significant nations are on that list. And as we look through the list, think about uh, nations that were involved in uh, massive human rights violations back at an earlier time in history, but uh, nations that are now joined to allow the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and some of its best work has been done in connection with the abuses that took place in that historic period. Um, as we look at the court itself, there are seven judges. They serve six-year terms. They can be reelected to a second term. The jurisdiction is adjudicatory uh, in 
the way that international lawyers talk about it, uh, it, is, it is contentious jurisdiction and advisory jurisdiction. Contentious jurisdiction is that jurisdiction uh, in which the parties opposing one another come to the court and seek resolution of some issue. Advisory is, to, is used to give in, information to member states or to uh, bodies of the Organization of American States about uh, issues relating to human rights in the Americas. Uh, I now want to go to the African Union. Um, this was originally the Organization of African Uni Unity. It was organized in 1963 and represented the nations of Africa. Let's pause for a minute and think about the history of Africa. Up until the end of World War II, most of Africa was still colonized and under the control of principally European nations. Uh, it was only uh, after World War II that we began to see the nations of Africa getting their independence. And we saw a steady march of that independence going through a, a long period of history. Uh, the, African, the African Union, which came out of the old organization of African unity, uh, was formed uh, quite late in 1999. And before the African Union was formed, uh, the African nations agreed to an African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Look at the wording of this charter. It's a little bit different from what we've seen with other human rights charters. Here, there's some emphasis on people's rights, on the rights to culture. And as you compare these uh, human rights documents from Europe, the Americas, and Africa, you'll find really interesting provisions in the African Charter. Africa has also uh, other regional organizations. Some of them have court systems that allow um, uh, consideration of human rights issues. Uh, as you look through the uh, organization of these uh, sub-regional, so or regional organizations within Africa, you'll find many of them organized around economic communities. And uh, there are a number, some of them more important for our purposes than other. There's an East African community. Uh, there is an economic community of Central African states, an economic community of West African states, and there is a Southern African development community. I'm not naming all of them, but these are, can be significant because some of them, some of these uh, sub-regional or regional within Africa organizations also have their own court. And as you begin to look at those courts, you can see that some of them have jurisdiction to deal with human rights issues. And indeed, uh, the uh, uh, citizens of the uh, economic community of West African states have filed complaints for human rights violations and the court system has, uh, in, in practice, uh, adjudicated a number of those cases. One of the um, court system that's been set up uh, was that of the uh, Southern African uh, Development Community, and it has its own tribunal. Uh, it was uh, provided with authority to look at human rights violations, and indeed in one notable case, uh, it decided that uh, Zimbabwe uh, was acting contrary to the human rights of, of farmers, of white farmers, who were having their property taken away from them through violence or through processes that uh, did not have any uh, due process of law. And now, since 2012, uh, that tribunal has had its authority to do human rights litigation uh, resolution taken away from it. There is before the African Court of Human Rights 
is set up. We have the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, and it has done quite a lot of work. It receives state reports, that is, reports from nations about their performance, sort of self-reporting on what's going on relating to human rights within their communities. The African Commission has been quite active in using special representatives, uh, rapporteurs, to examine topics like torture, prisons, and free expression. Uh, th this process of using rapporteurs is common to all three of these systems in Europe, uh, Americas, and in Africa. And frequently, good things have come out of this type of review. Uh, in uh, 1981, we get the Charter, African Charter of Human and People's Rights adopted. Um, uh, again, recognize the chronology here that we have uh, the Charter now being adopted before the court is in place. Uh, you have a protocol adopted in 1998 establishing the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and the protocol becomes effective in 2004. The nations that have submitted uh, to the jurisdiction of the court are number about 26 uh, as of 2013. As you look at the chart, uh, look at the map, you'll see that a number of those nations around, particularly around the southern uh, or southeastern coast of Africa have accepted jurisdiction. Significant uh, nations in Central Africa have not submitted to this jurisdiction. The, uh, looking at the court organization, there are 11 members of the court elected for six-year terms, and they can be re-elected only once. It's sort of significant that the president of this court works full-time. All other 10 members of the court work part-time. So this is not a court that is very, very busy. Uh, it, uh, it has jurisdiction to take up cases concerning the African uh, Charter and Protocol. It, it sits in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, again, its jurisdiction is contentious and advisory, uh, much like the other uh, courts in Europe and, and Africa. The first judgment of this court determined that the uh, application was inadmissible. And in the early history of this court, all other applications have been deemed inadmissible. So we do not yet have much jurisprudence coming out of the African uh, Court for Human and People's Rights, and we just have to follow that as time proceeds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that this now gives you an overview of the uh, three major systems of, of human rights through regional apparatus. There is uh, some apparatus in Asia, but it is not uh, fully uh, functioning as a human rights regime. Uh, we do not have the overlay of treaties or of, of institutions such as commissions and courts that would really bring human rights uh, into focus in, in Asia. So we're left with these three courts, very different uh, from one another. Uh, having looked now at the American and African uh, system of human rights, I must say again that as you compare the three, the, the one that seems to be most robust uh, is that in Europe. But some great things have been done through the uh, American system and through your class presentations, we'll have a chance to look at some of this performance by the courts.